The Principles of Economics by Carl Menger Chapter 1. The General Theory of the Good Section 1. The General Theory of the Good All things are subject to the law of cause and effect. This great principle knows no exception, and we would search in vain in the realm of experience for an example to the contrary. Human progress has no tendency to cast it in doubt, but rather the effect of confirming it, and of always further widening knowledge of the scope of its validity. Its continued and growing recognition is therefore closely linked to human progress. One's own person, moreover, and any of its states are links in this great universal structure of relationships. It is impossible to conceive of a change of one's person from one state to another in any way other than one subject to the law of causality. If, therefore, one passes from a state of need to a state in which the need is satisfied, sufficient causes for this change must exist. There must be forces in operation within one's organism that remedy the disturbed state, or there must be external things acting upon it that by their nature are capable of producing the state we call satisfaction of our needs. Things that can be placed in a causal connection with the satisfaction of human needs we term useful things. If, however, we both recognize this causal connection and have the power actually to direct the useful things to the satisfaction of our needs, we call them goods. If a thing is to become a good, or in other words, if it is to acquire goods character, all four of the following prerequisites must be simultaneously present. 1. A human need. 2. Such properties as render the thing capable of being brought into a causal connection with the satisfaction of this need. 3. Human knowledge of this causal connection. 4. Command of the thing sufficient to direct it to the satisfaction of the need. Only when all four of these prerequisites are present simultaneously can a thing become a good. When even one of them is absent, a thing cannot acquire good's character. And a thing already possessing good's character would lose it at once if but one of the four prerequisites ceased to be present. Hence a thing loses its good's character, one, if owing to a change in human needs. The particular needs disappear that the thing is capable of satisfying. Two, whenever the capacity of the thing is to be placed in a causal connection with the satisfaction of human needs is lost as the result of a change in its own properties. Three, if the knowledge of the causal connection between the thing and the satisfaction of human needs disappears, or four, if men lose command of it so completely that they can no longer apply it directly to the satisfaction of their needs and have no means of re-establishing their power to do so. A special situation can be observed whenever things that are incapable of being placed in any kind of causal connection with the satisfaction of human needs are nevertheless treated by men as goods. This occurs, one, when attributes and therefore capacities are erroneously ascribed to things that do not really possess them, or two, when non-existent human needs are mistakenly assumed to exist. In both cases, we have to deal with things that do not, in reality, stand in the relationship already described as determining the good's character of things, but do so in the opinions of people. Among things of the first class are most cosmetics, all charms, the majority of medicines administered to the sick by peoples of early civilizations and by primitives even today, divining rods, love potions, etc. For all these things are incapable of actually satisfying the needs they are supposed to serve. Among things of the second class are medicines for diseases that do not actually exist. The implements, statues, buildings, etc. used by the pagan people for the worship of idols, instruments of torture, and the like. Such things, therefore, as derive their goods character merely from properties they are imagined to possess or from needs merely imagined by men may appropriately be called imaginary goods. As a people attain higher levels of civilization, and as men penetrate more deeply into the true constitution of things and of their own nature, the number of true goods becomes constantly larger, and as can easily be understood, the number of imaginary goods becomes progressively smaller. It is not unimportant evidence of the connection between accurate knowledge and human welfare that the number of so-called imaginary goods 
is shown by experience to be usually greatest among peoples who are poorest in true goods. Of special scientific interest are the goods that have been treated by some writers in our discipline as a special class of goods called relationships. In this category are firms, goodwill, monopolies, copyrights, patents, trade licenses, authors' rights, and also, according to some writers, family connections, friendship, love, religious and scientific fellowships, etc. It may readily be conceded that a number of these relationships do not allow a rigorous test of their goods character, but that many of them, such as firms, monopolies, copyrights, customer goodwill, and the like, are actually goods is shown. Even without appeal to further proof by the fact that we often encounter them as objects of commerce. Nevertheless, if the theorist who have devoted himself most closely to this topic admits that the classification of these relationships as goods has something strange about it and appears to the unprejudiced eye as an anomaly, there must, in my opinion, be a somewhat deeper reason for such doubts than the unconscious working of the materialistic bias of our time, which regards only materials and forces, tangible objects and labor services, as things and therefore also as goods. It has been pointed out several times by students of law that our language has no term for useful actions in general, but only one for labor services. Yet there is a whole series of actions and even mere inactions which cannot be called labor services, but which are nevertheless decidedly useful to certain persons for whom they may even have considerable economic value. That someone buys commodities from me or uses my legal services is certainly no labor service on his part, but it is nevertheless an action beneficial to me. That a well-to-do doctor seizes the practice of medicine in a small country town in which there is only one other doctor in addition to himself can with still less justice be called a labor service. But it is certainly an inaction of considerable benefit to the remaining doctor who thereby becomes a monopolist. Whether a larger or smaller number of persons regularly performs actions that are beneficial to someone, a number of customers with respect to a merchant, for instance, does not alter the nature of these actions. And whether certain inactions on the part of some or all the inhabitants of a city or state which are useful to someone come about voluntarily or through legal compulsion, natural or legal monopolies, copyrights, trademarks, etc., does not alter in any way the nature of these useful inactions. From an economic standpoint, therefore, what are called clientels, goodwill, monopolies, etc., are the useful actions or inactions of other people, or, as in the case of firms, for example, aggregates the material goods, labor services, and other useful actions and inactions. Even relationships of friendship and love religious fellowships, and the like, consist obviously of actions or inactions of other persons that are beneficial to us. If, as is true of customer goodwill, firms, monopoly rights, etc., these useful actions or inactions are of such a kind that we can dispose of them, there is no reason why we should not classify them as goods without finding it necessary to resort to the obscure concept of relationships and without bringing these relationships into contrast with all other goods as a special category. On the contrary, all goods can, I think, be divided into two classes of material goods, including all forces of nature insofar as they are goods and of useful human actions and inactions, the most important of which are labor services.